Good morning, Stonebridge Bible Church. Take your Bible and turn with me to the end of John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Thank you, Jonathan, for leading us in worship this morning. Today we're going to embark on the third chapter of John's gospel, and we're going to do so over the next few weeks because it would be a travesty to simply gloss over the significant bedrock doctrines that are here in this third chapter. Maybe you're wondering why, and the answer would be because heaven and hell hang in the balance of your understanding of this third chapter of John's gospel. Jesus is going to articulate that there is only one type of person that goes to heaven, one. Do you wanna know who that is? Well, we're gonna observe this morning. There are a lot of different elements about the Christian faith that you may not understand. There may be some things that you may be unaware of or not necessarily sure how those things get flushed out in the Bible. For instance, I was talking some eschatological elements the other day with a couple friends. Eschatology meaning the way that everything's gonna end. How is the world gonna end? When is the rapture? And, and you may come to maybe a different perspective and theological conviction than I have. And the truth is we could both end up in glory um, because we know the savior. Maybe you disagree with some people and say, well, Paul in Romans 7 is actually an unbeliever, not a believer when he says, oh, wretched man who, that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, the things I don't wanna do, I do. And sometimes people would say, well, that's a Christian talking. He, he's mourning over his remaining sin. And others would say, no, he is actually re referring to when he didn't know God. You could have a different perspective on that. You could have a different perspective on the ongoing nature and function of the Holy Spirit, and you can still end up in glory with those whom you disagree with. However, there is no one in heaven that doesn't understand the seedlings of the truth we will examine today, that has not experienced the miracle that Jesus is going to articulate Heaven and hell are in the balance. And I can't think of anything more critical for you to understand or anything more crucial for you to remind yourself of if you're a Christian than this truth that Jesus is going to talk about regarding the new birth or as some may say, being born again. This term and phraseology has become so common in our contemporary church culture that it's been dragged through the mud. And in the last 50 or so years, it's lost all significance and really its value and meaning. One of the realities that we are going to observe today, and you need to understand this, whether you're a young boy or an old man, you need to understand this, that salvation is not extended to those who go to church, try harder, do better, or stay away from big sins, or come from a good, solid family, or know the truth. It is for the person who has been regenerated. And we're gonna talk about what that means today, but I wanna ask you this morning from the get-go, have you been born again? Have you been transformed from the inside out? Let's read our passage for today. And I wanna start actually in John 2.23, and then we'll read through the fourth verse of John chapter three. Chapter two, verse 23. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? We're gonna cover this full conversation over the next couple weeks. And five times in the opening 10 verses of John chapter three, Jesus is going to refer to the reality that in order for you to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. I want to examine this theme in detail, and I want to eavesdrop on a conversation that is 2,000 years old between a man named Nicodemus and Jesus. 
as this passage is going to detail for us, Nicodemus represents not only the Jews, but functions to represent every single man who is pursuing a right standing with God through the means of religion. And so we're going to put on ancient eyes today and we're going to go down a dark Palestinian street where a perplexed man is wandering limestone alleys and arrives at a place where Jesus is staying and comes to him under the banner of night in the cloak of evening. He's got a lot going for him. He's a wealthy, respected, religious leader. And yet he, he has even more on his mind. Side note, just in regards to this conversation, Jesus throughout his ministry preaches to thousands of people at a time. And then he will train and disciple a group of 12 men. So there's this contrast and juxtaposition. He will feed 5,000 people multiple times. And then at the end of John's gospel, he will make breakfast for a select few of his disciples. At the beginning of John chapter two, he cleanses a temple in a very public act of force and power. And here he is going to have an intimate conversation with a single man. I wanna break down our study in God's living word today by looking at religion's fascination, religion's features, religion's flattery, religion's futility, and rebirth's necessity. If you're a note taker, look with me first at religion's fascination. It says in John 2, 23, though, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. We glanced over this last week, but we really need to observe once again, because it, it functions as the foundation for the conversation that's going to take place in John chapter three. Remember in John chapter two, Jesus turns the water into wine. And John throughout his gospel is going to refer to these miracles, not as miracles, but as signs, because they are significant of something deeper and something more that God is trying to show us in his word. But this is just a mere sampling. These seven or eight signs, if you include the cleansing of the temple, are a mere sampling, a drop in the divine bucket of the signs that Jesus was performing every single day for three years. He eradicated disease and demon possession from the land of Israel. And the crowds were flocking to him. Jesus, heal my son, heal my daughter, cleanse me of leprosy, give sight to my blind eyes. I'm deaf, help me. And, and whatever it may be, over and over and over again, he was performing these signs. Remember in John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, therefore many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And then the last verse of John's gospel, it says this in John 21, 25, there are many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. There is, I, I want you to try to grasp this. There is a thousand things that Jesus did that are not written in the scripture. But the point of the passage in John 2, 23 is that the people were watching and witnessing these signs. And it says that they believed in him. It says that they pastuo in the Greek in Jesus. But the thing that's interesting is that in verse 24, it says, but Jesus on his part was not pastuo in them. They pastuo in Jesus, they believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not believe in them. What's the point? Well, they were pregnant with messianic expectations. They were waiting for the Messiah. They were drawn to his signs. What's the point? It just shows us this, that not all belief is saving belief. You can be fascinated by Jesus. And these Jews were infatuated by Jesus. They were entertained by Jesus. They affirmed the power of Jesus. And yet they were strangers to Jesus. We're gonna see this throughout John's gospel. Jesus is going to call the people out because they believe in what he is doing, but they don't believe in him salvifically. They're not coming to him as a savior. They're coming to him as the source of power to give them what they want. In John chapter six, Jesus crosses to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and they follow him. And he says, you've come here, not because your soul is hungry, but because your bellies are hungry. You want full bellies, not full hearts, but I am the bread of life. 
You came here for a sandwich. I'm here to give you eternal life. And they miss the point over and over and over again. He's not entrusting himself to them. Why? Because of his omniscience, which means he knows all things and he knows every nook and cranny of every single human hidden heart. 224. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them. Why? He knew all men. Jesus doesn't need anyone to come up and give him the details concerning your soul. This morning, Jesus Christ knows you. He knows you at a deeper level than anyone else because he does not need testimony about you to know you. He knows your heart. He doesn't know what you speak. Merely, it's out of the mouth the heart speaks and or out of the heart the mouth speaks and he knows the depths of your soul. And in verse 25, it says, because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man for he himself knew what was in man. Now, there's this emphasis in the closing verses of 24 and 25 on men. He knew all men. He does not need anyone to testify concerning man for he knew what was in man. Anthropos, anthropos, anthropos. Now remember, when the Bible's being written, there is no chapter breakdowns. Chapter breakdowns came later on when itinerant preachers that were traveling from city to city on horseback, they came along to provide some sort of frame of reference for people to turn to this chapter and this chapter. But when the gospel's being written, it's just a continuous story. And the first word of John chapter three says now, or de in Greek, which means it's an immediate transition from what is happening at the end of chapter two, referring to Jesus's total omniscience of your heart and of all men. And then it's going to introduce to us a character that is the poster boy of religion. And Jesus knows even his heart. So look with me at religion's features. Secondly, if you're taking notes, John is about to introduce us to a man that is similarly fascinated by Jesus, who may trust in Jesus superficially and yet Jesus does not trust in him. It says in verse one, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Josephus says that at the time of Jesus, there was about 6,000 Pharisees in the land of Israel. The Pharisees had emerged during the intertestamental period, which is the period between the last book of the Old Testament, which is Malachi, and the first book of the New Testament, which is Matthew. There's 400 years in that intertestamental period. And the Pharisees had emerged to the scene because the people of Israel were growing more and more apostate. They had turned their back on God. And to be a Pharisee was to be zealous for the word of God and the honor of God. It quite literally means to be separate, to be a cut above. They're watching the people, they're lackadaisical in their pursuit and love of God. We're going to be a Pharisee. We're going to honor God so fastidiously and with great fervent devotion that even though he's being dishonored, we will honor God. His word is being neglected. We will spend two hours a day on our knees and then 10 hours a day in God's holy book. And it says that Nicodemus is one of these such men. I don't want you to miss this. And this, this is the point just as we begin regarding Nicodemus. You don't get any better than Nicodemus. You don't get any holier, any more respected than the guy we are about to visit. I wanna give you seven features of this man named Nicodemus. Number one, he was educated. Since the time Nicodemus was a young boy, he would have been trained and taught in the scriptures. This week I was with Lily, my daughter, she's two and a half and her friends. And I'm trying to just catechize my kids. Lily, who made you? God. Why did God make you? For his glory. <laughs> you better believe it. And I'll say, Lily, ask for God. His way is what? Talk to me. Perfect. And that means what? It means God makes no mistakes. That's right, Lily. And I look at Katie and I'm boom, boom, boom. Come on, we're doing something right here. We're doing this. And we get proud when our kids can give one word answers for his glory. We need to understand that every single Jewish boy and every single Pharisee, by the time they were eight years old, they had memorized verbatim Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 
You're not just asking them, why did God make the world? They would say, well, God made the world for 25 reasons. Starting in Genesis, he made it quorum Deo, before the face of, to the glory of, and in the presence of God. They would be able to articulate for you the whole Bible. And it was not just these memorized facts. It was rehearsed and rooted so deeply. Have you ever talked to a kid where you go, man, I'm talking to an adult. Who are you? Every single Jewish boy that would become a Pharisee. They knew more, at, nor, more about the Bible at age seven than 99% of this room. And they would have studied and drawn deeply from the wells of scripture. They were highly educated. But Nicodemus is not just highly educated, he's also intellectual. He's intellectual in the sense that he's not just a walking Bible. He's not just a, a rolling commentary. He's a deep thinker. He's a philosopher. How do we know? Well, Nicodemus is a Greek name. There's very few people in ancient Palestine that were Jews that would have Greek names. Nicodemus' name comes from the word Nike. His name means the one who conquers, which means that he would have not only studied the Bible, but he would have studied Greek culture and had a diversity in his training and upbringing he was a scholar, he was a philosopher, he was a pontificator. According to Bachman, the commentator, sources reveal that there are only four Palestinian Jews between 330 BC and 200 AD that had the name Nicodemus. And all of them belong to the same family, the Gurion family. We'll talk more about this in a moment. He was educated, he was intellectual. Number three, he was devoted. He was serious about honoring and obeying the word of God. The Pharisees would carry food no more than the weight of a fig on the Sabbath because they didn't want to violate the Sabbath. They would carry no more milk than could be swallowed with a single gulp because they didn't want to violate the Sabbath. They would put their mirrors face down because on the Sabbath they didn't want to see a gray hair in their beard and then be tempted to pluck it, thus violating the Sabbath. They were all chips in for God. God must be honored. We live in a world where our habits and schedules and wallets often contradict our claims of belonging to God. But to the Pharisee, there was nothing more serious than their zealous commitment to obey the Bible. Number four, Nicodemus was immensely wealthy. According to history of the Gurion family and Nicodemus himself, we know this not only from history, but just from the plain reading of the scripture, as a Pharisee and as a ruler of the Sanhedrin, he was a very wealthy man. The Gurion family historically received their wealth because Nicodemus' grandfather and great-grandfather were military heroes, and they were rewarded by receiving lands and estates and great wealth. And as a Pharisee, he would have taken great pride in being generous with this money. He would have viewed it as a stewardship. Remember in Luke 18, it says, I tithe of everything that I get. And that was the Pharisee. The picture Jesus paints for us of a Pharisee is that they were generous with their money. And so Nicodemus is very wealthy, very generous. I have a need. Oh, don't worry about that need. It's been taken care of. Compliments of the Gurian family. He was educated, intellectual, religious, generous. Number five, he was influential. Look with me at verse one. It says, this was a man of the Pharisees, comma, a ruler of the Jews. What does this mean? It means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. There were 6,000 Pharisees in the land of Israel. And then there was a group of 71 individuals, including the high priest that governed the legislative, administrative, and judicial branches of the Jewish government. They would conduct trials, investigate heresy, they would function as the liaison between the Jewish people and the Roman Empire. And Nicodemus is amongst this ruling class. Six, Nicodemus was respected. I don't know if you can grasp the gravity of this. Every single Pharisee was a teacher. They would teach and preach and train others with the word of God every single day of their life. But Nicodemus is not just a teacher, verse 10. He's what? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the definitive article 
teacher of Israel and do not understand these things. Nicodemus is the most respected, one of the wealthiest, revered, honored, religious men in all of Judaism. It was as if you could take the influence, biblically speaking, of a Charles Spurgeon and combine that with the national leadership of Winston Churchill and combine that into one individual that was Nicodemus. There he is, guys, there he is, kids, there he is, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Nicodemus, come kiss my newborn child. Nicodemus, come to the wedding of my daughter. Nicodemus, come pray for my father, he's ill. Nicodemus, we have a question for you about Yahweh. Sit down, okay, sit down, settle down, settle down. What's your question? I've got the answer. My name is Nicodemus. Maybe you have a spiritual hero in mind, a man or a woman that you'd love to have dinner with and just hear them talk about their love for the Lord, their knowledge of the scripture. Maybe that's an R.C. Sproul or George Mueller. For the nation of Israel, it's Nicodemus. He's educated, intellectual, devoted, wealthy, influential, respected, but he's one other thing. He is extremely anxious. Why? Because when you reach the apex of your religion and have no surety of your salvation, there is no greater worry than that. You could be headlong into sin and still not experience the anxiety that plagues the person who knows every single answer and then is coming to grips with the reality they don't know God. This could be you this morning. Know the truth, have confidence about every single answer and then have no confidence that you even know the one who gives the answers. There is no greater worry than being this man Lurking in the shadows of his heart, there is a fear that he is too fearful to admit. Why? Because religion is an outside system. And we just read, God looks at the heart. God's going to, Jesus is going to unmask these guys. You clean the outside of a cup, on the inside, you you leave it totally dirty. You're like a whitewashed tomb. You look good, paint that thing up. Inside, you're full of dead man's bones. You tithe mint and rue and You neglect the most simple part of being a follower of God, which is what? Loving him. They love the law more than they love the giver of the law. You can love truth more than you love the truth in the person of Jesus Christ. Nicodemus is troubled because he affirms heaven and hell and does not even know where he's headed. Look with me third at religion's flattery. I just want to make some four observations about his opening salutation to Jesus. You can be respectful of Jesus and be a total stranger to him. He first calls him rabbi. Nicodemus would have been called rabbi every single day of his life. And here he calls a 30-year-old Galilean carpenter rabbi. He says, we know Verse two, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. Who's we? We is the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. No one could deny Jesus' power. We know. First person, plural. This is something that is an agreed reality amongst everyone amongst us. This is, miracles weren't happening all the time in the Bible. I told you, we get this idea that, oh, in the Bible, miracles were happening all the time. No, miracles were as abnormal to them as they would be to us. That's why they were authenticators and validators of the identity and message of Jesus Christ. And he says, we know that being the Sanhedrin who was the most hostile and most aggressive enemy that Jesus had. He says, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. The people marveled as they listened to Jesus. I want you to just think about this because he wasn't communicating rehearsed, memorized truth. He was the embodiment of truth. He's not looking and saying, it says here, hmm.
get the picture. I can stop now. He's ripping. I mean, he's getting after people. He is the truth. And he is communicating to them as one. And they're marveling. You know, I and Luke, it says they marveled at his words because he spoke as one who had authority, not as the scribes and Pharisees, because when you're communicating someone else's message, there's only so much passion you can have. But this is the word of God. And when the Logos, the word of God comes in human flesh, he is going after people in love and passion and sincerity. And they marvel not only at his authority, but it says also 12 verses later, they're marveling at the gracious words that are follow, falling from his lips. Who is this man? He must be from God. We all know it. Everyone agree, everyone agree. Okay, Nicodemus, you're going. Tell him we know he's gotta be from some other place. Because what school did he go to? Did you train him? Did you train him? I didn't train him. Where's this guy coming from? He speaks as one who has authority. And he says, you're from God. And then he says, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, verse three is interesting because it says Jesus answered and said to him, but I don't see a question in verse two. So what's happening? Well, Jesus is going to display the omniscience that is revealed in the last three verses of John chapter two by circumventing this salutation statement by Nicodemus and going straight to the heart of the matter. He doesn't need Nicodemus to tell Jesus what's on his mind. He knows Nicodemus's heart. And he begins by saying, hey, listen, okay. Truly, truly, I say to you. Okay, anytime you see truly, truly in John's gospel, it's gonna happen 25 times. Anytime you see truly, truly, it's time to dial in because it's verily, verily, amen, amen, truly, truly, 25 times, whatever Jesus is about to say is of utmost importance. If you've been lacking in your engagement, perk up, sit up, listen, this is important because Jesus is about to say that unless you understand the following sentence, your soul hangs in the balance. So look with me at number four, religion's futility. This has staggering implications for us all. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. What is Jesus telling Nicodemus? He's telling Nicodemus, you might not be in the kingdom. Actually, you're not. And all of Nicodemus's categories are shattered. He looks at Jesus, or Nicodemus and he says, your education, your intellect, your devotion, your generosity, your influence, your respect that you receive, it merits you. Understand this. Your pedigree, Nicodemus, it does not merit you a single drop of the love of God. There is nothing you have done, nor is there anything about who you are that curries the favor of God. Can I tell you something? Being religious never got a single person into the kingdom of God. Knowing the Bible has never got a single person into the kingdom of God. Coming from a good family has never got a single person into the kingdom of God. Being fastidiously obedient to the word of God has never got a single person into the word of God or into the kingdom of God. Do you understand this? If you miss this, you quite literally do not understand the gospel. I'm even more aware that in every church, there are people who have grown up in such a way that they have never come to grips with the reality that in order to be a child of God, it's not something you advance into, it's a miracle you receive. Boys and girls, are you listening? Because if you've grown up in mom and dad's home and have known the truth your whole life, God doesn't need to do any less of a miracle in your heart than a prison inmate which is why even, and this is just side note, and, and I've told you this in regards to children's ministry, I'm not teaching the kids back there as if they are Christians at three years old. My daughter, Lily, sweetie, she does not know God. She's not a Christian. 
She's not born a Christian. Psalm 51, five, in sin was she conceived. So what am I trying to do with Lily? I'm trying to give her a high view of the character of God. So she sees a magnified view of his holiness and then comes to grips with the reality she needs a savior. She's not a Christian by pedigree, by being the daughter of a pastor who was the son of a pastor. Her, her being my daughter provides her with no additional favor before God. Jesus says, unless. We're gonna spend the next two weeks talking about the reality of what this means, this rebirth, this regeneration. But the word unless denotes a necessary condition. Unless you put gas in the car, the car will not drive. Unless you take this medicine, you will not get better. Unless you ask her out on a date, she will not be your girlfriend. Sorry guys, it's not gonna happen. You need to ask her out. Now, there's books entitled How to Be Born Again, but the title of those books are missing the entire point. There is no five-step method of collaborating with God to get into the kingdom of God. Man always tries to find exceptions to this. Jesus is telling the most religious and perceptibly the most righteous man on planet earth, you don't need to turn over a new leaf. You need new birth. I used at camp, you know, I used to hear guys, there were different analogies and illustrations for the gospel that different people would use. And someone would say, hey, you're drowning. And Jesus, through his love, and they're well-meaning, has thrown you a life vest and you're sinking. So cling to Jesus. What's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong. Dead men don't grab. You're not spiritually sinking. You're sunk. You're not spiritually sick. You're spiritually dead. And Jesus is saying it's no less than divine power that takes you and makes you new. You could be in the church your whole life and miss the foundational footing of what it means to be a child of God. Has anybody ever told you, unless God does a miracle in your heart, you're going to hell? Jesus uses hard words for hard realities. And he doesn't mince words when heaven and hell are at stake. Jesus is asking you through his living word, riddle me this, what contribution did you make to your physical birth? Cerro, Spanish. <laughs> Rosetta Stone. <laughs> did you consult your parents? Did you determine your birthday? No. The doors of the kingdom of God are only open to one type of person, and that is the person who has abandoned every single attempt to earn their way to God, and who has totally stomped on the thought process that salvation is a synergistic process by which they collaborate with God. He does most, I do some. No, salvation is not synergistic. Salvation is monergistic, mono being one. It's God who makes you alive. Wait a second, I thought I placed my faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, even the ability to place your faith in Christ, it says in Romans, is a gift. Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not as a result of your own works so that no man can boast. It is a what? gift from God. Even your ability to place your faith in Jesus Christ is a gift that follows God regenerating your heart. And that's why we say in theological terms, regeneration always precedes faith. Because it's not your faith that saves. It's the object of your faith that saves. It's Jesus who saves. And Jesus is the one through his spirit that makes you alive. Ephesians 2, you were dead in your sin, but God made us alive. He's not healing spiritually sick. He's resurrecting spiritually dead. And if you've never understood that you were dead or are dead, you'll never cry out for the remedy. A proper diagnosis is essential. The one who looks at their religious pedigree, experience, and devotion and understands that it did not merit a single drop of the love of God is finally at the first rung of the ladder an understanding 
who the kingdom of God is open to, Isaiah 64, 6, our best deeds of righteousness are filthy rags. Entering the kingdom of God doesn't begin with a reformation of our behavior, but a regeneration of our heart. That word regeneration, palingenesia, comes from a word that Jesus uses in Matthew 19, 28, when he's talking about the renewal of the heavens and the earth. Just the good reminder for us that for all of eternity, we're not disembodied spirits floating around on clouds like Tom and Jerry playing a harp. We are real people on a real new heavens and new earth. And Jesus tells us exactly what's gonna happen to this world. It's gonna burn with fire and he's gonna create a whole new world. He's going to palingenesia the whole planet. He's gonna make it new. And that same word is used to describe what God's spirit needs to do in your life. That amount of divine power is what's necessary for you to become a child of God and me. I'm obviously a little pumped. And, and it's because of this. I'm a steward. You can be in, your, in the church your whole life and not understand that God doesn't do spring cleaning in your heart. He has to remake you. You don't need a new start. You need a new heart. Entering the kingdom of God is not based on what you achieve. It's based on what you receive as a gift from God. It's not something you produce. It's something that is done to you. And this is true not only for a man of Nicodemus's caliber, but true for all of us. The Jews thought they would enter the kingdom of God because they were Jews, because it was their birthright. We have Abraham as our father. And Jesus says, listen, who your parents are doesn't matter at all as it relates to your entrance into the kingdom. Because no one is writing their last name into glory. James 1.18 says, in the exercise of his will, he gave us birth by the word of truth. 1 Peter 1.3, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again even in John 1, 12, we looked at this maybe six or seven weeks ago. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were, what? Born. How are you born again? Well, it's not of blood. It's not your family. It's not of the will of the flesh. It's not your effort, nor is it the will of man. It's not religion. It's God. John six sixty three. it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. This is the very hinge of the gospel. Question for you. Who will ever enter the kingdom of God without being born again? What's the answer? Not a single person ever. Has God ever done a miracle in your heart? Well, the answer may be no if you've never thought you needed a miracle in the first place. Because if your view of sin is small and shallow, then it's a favor. But if you realize that every attempt in your own righteousness is utterly corrupt, desperate, futile, that's the seedlings of life. Maybe you're getting worried because you're going, man, I, I don't remember when I was born again, but I know I love Jesus now. I don't remember the day. Well, let me just encourage you, neither do I. Dan, that's Dan's spot in the second row. I don't know your birthday, Dan, but I know you're alive. Why? Because he's sitting there and he's showing signs of life. And every six or seven minutes or so, I get an amen from Dan. <laughs> I need him. I know he's alive because he shows me signs of life. How can I know if I'm spiritually alive? Well, if you're showing signs of life. Because when God takes your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh, it says in Ezekiel, and we're gonna look at this in detail next week, he gives you a new heart. And do you know what it says that God's gonna do when he gives you a new heart? He's gonna give you a heart that longs to know him, that loves him, where obedience is not just a duty, it's a delight. And if you can say amen to that, then I would tell you, well, well, no man wants to honor God in that way and loves him and longs to know him apart from 
a new heart. Look with me at verse four and then we'll be done. And we're gonna see an example today of what new life in Christ is like as we hear a testimony. We're gonna have a baptism to and communion to close our service. But in verse four, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Let me just close with this. Religion does not get this. They cannot fathom that they do nothing for God in order for them to be right with God. Nicodemus is saying, how can I start over? Well, you can't start over. You need a new heart. It's not something you're gonna do. How can I enter back into my mother's womb? No, you need to go and ask God if you're even today going, man, I don't know if I've ever experienced this. Then what do you do? What do I do? You go and ask God to do a miracle in your heart. You don't go do anything. You ask God to do something in you. Believe in him. Confess your sin. Repent. Turn to Jesus. There's different ways salvation is explained throughout the Bible. In 10 verses from now, it's going to say believe. In nine verses, it's going to say look. But it all comes out of a heart that's been changed by God. And we're going to hear the testimony of someone even now whose heart has been changed by God. Let me pray, and then we'll have baptism. Lord, we love you, and we're thankful that salvation is not synergistic. It's monergistic because God doesn't share glory so that no man can boast. Lord, I pray for anybody in here that maybe is leaning on tiny islands of their own righteousness and small deposits of their religious devotion as a way of confidence in their standing before you. Would you shatter their categories like you did to Nicodemus so that we can cry out for the miracle Lord, one day you're gonna make all things new and Lord, we just pray, start with our hearts. Lord, for those who have a regenerated heart, we sang this morning, day by day, I know you will renew me. We are regenerated in Christ positionally and salvifically once upon a time and then we are renewed day by day until we meet you face to face. We thank you for the testimony we're about to hear. We pray this in your name and all God's people said. Amen.